We now move to questions to the Minister of Justice. I call Mr Sean Lidge. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Kirst Everhain, question one. Principal Deputy Speaker, with permission, I will take questions one, six and seven together. And I apologise, that may make me slightly longer than usual. McGabry is a challenging and complex high security prison, and this report demonstrates that. The progress that the prison made in 2012 continued through to 2014 against a backdrop of experienced staff leaving under the voluntary exit scheme with new staff coming in. The prison has faced three key challenges, resourcing, building a consistent regime and delivering outcomes for prisoners. The report of the visit in May demonstrated that McGabry had been greatly affected by staff absence, which had a serious impact on the regime and outcomes for prisoners. This has been addressed through robust management of attendance, recruitment and redeployment from other prisons. Since August, sickness levels have fallen sharply, which means more officers on the landings and a more progressive regime. The Director General of the Prison Service has already taken steps to strengthen the leadership team at McGabry, which included the appointment of Phil Ragg as Governor. NIPS has developed a detailed action plan to address each of the strategic recommendations contained in the report. This has been published on the NIPS website so that the service can be held to account against that plan. What is important now is that the right leadership team is in place and in the six months since the inspection, the prison service has taken action to improve the immediate performance of McGabry to ensure the prison is delivering better outcomes for prisoners and playing its part in building a safer Northern Ireland. I'm confident that when the inspectors return in January, they will see significant improvement. I think it is important to reinforce that the context in which McGabry operates is not the same as any prison in neighbouring jurisdictions. Prison officers are under severe threat, meaning an attack is highly likely. NIPS has effective mechanisms in place to disseminate information relating to threats, and staff are fully supported when security concerns are raised. Any threats to others, including contractors, is a matter for the PSNI, and there are arrangements in place to share information in this respect. In this context, I'm very encouraged that over 1,700 people have applied for the recent prison service recruitment campaign. These individuals, individuals have an opportunity to play their part in building a safer community. Mr. Lynch, for supplementary. Gom Don Fraga, I want to thank the Minister for his comprehensive answer. But does the Minister agree with me that a combination of failure of leadership in the prison and a refusal and resistance to prison reform has led to what can only be described as a damning report by the CGA? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, when I spoke to the report last week, I did highlight that what I believe we now had was good leadership in place, both at prison headquarters and within McGabry itself, and very good cooperation between the Governor and the headquarters team. So I think what we have now got is leadership. And there is no doubt that as we proceed through the reform program, there are some people who have had more difficulty adjusting to it than others. But what we are now seeing is a team working together at McGabry under the leadership of the governor in conjunction with the work being done by NIPS headquarters and by the department. Call Mr. Jim Allister. The minister hasn't mentioned it, but a significant part of the report dealt with what could be classed as the disproportionate focus on the separated prisoners and the adverse effect that was having on the rest of the prison. What has been done to address that issue? Well, Mr. Alistair raises an entirely reasonable point. Uh, the decision to introduce separation was a decision taken by a previous Secretary of State some years ago. Decisions on who is admitted to separated conditions are decisions for the Secretary of State and not for the devolved minister. But the Department of Justice and the prison service has to then run the prison on the basis that there are two separated houses. Uh, as part of the, the current reform program, it is proposed to reconfigure McGabry into three mini prisons, which would separate out, if that's not an unfortunate use of the term, those who are category A prisoners whether normal category A or the two groups of separated prisoners, I would ensure that it was easier to deal with their needs separate from those of the main bulk of the prison population. And if capital funding is forthcoming, I'd be very keen to see that happen as soon as possible. 
Call Mr. David McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Uh, the Minister will be aware that in March of this year there were five prisoners arrested um, over allegations of making threats towards police officers. There have also been numerous complaints by contractors going into the prison that they too have been the subject uh, of threats coming from within, particularly Bush House. Uh, would the Minister wish to comment as to where we are today currently uh, with the state of threats which are issued against both? officers, police officers and contractors? Well, indeed, uh, the point is made very clearly by Mr McElveen, and it's a point which I've made before. I said in my key answer that the threat remains severe. That is the threat against individual officers as it is against police officers, and there's no doubt that it creates very difficult working conditions. It is unfortunate that in the particular context of the separated Republican prisoners, the agreement which was made in August 2010 which was predicated on uh, changes in the regime within Row House, balanced against an end of threats to prisoners, has not been matched by an ending of threats, whether delivered at times inside Row House or delivered by supporters of the dissident prisoners through websites and various other social media. If we are to make progress, then it is important that those threats should be removed, and it is important that prison officers should be able to go to work without facing threats either internally or when they leave afterwards. Call Mr. Colin Boylan. Uh, does the Minister agree that the August 2010 report by the Prison Assessors Team, led by Peter Bunting and on or provides where everyone, staff and prisoners, can be treated with dignity and respect in a conflict-free environment? Well, I'm happy to agree with Mr. Boylan, except I'm not sure that it would necessarily be suggested in a team of four equals that Peter Bunting was necessarily the leader, though he would undoubtedly be one of the co-leaders of it. He's absolutely right that the 2010 agreement provided the opportunities to move forward, but it appears to me that dissident supporters outside and dissidents inside have not played their part. Well, Mr. Pat Ramsey. Could, could I ask the Minister, in light of, of the extensive reporting of, of the investigation, there is deep worry and concern amongst the families of staff and the families of prisoners. Can the Minister give us an assurance that he's doing everything in his power to ensure the safety of both the staff and prisoners in McGabry? Well, I think Mr. Ramsey has indirectly highlighted one of the unfortunate consequences. Um, I've heard it reported in the media that the report said that McGabry was the most dangerous prison in Europe. It said no such thing. There were comments attributed by the Chief Inspector of Prisons from England at, the, at his press conference which went beyond the considered opinion of that report and certainly were not the comments from the Chief Inspector of Criminal Justice. But he's absolutely right that it is important that we ensure safety of staff and safety of prisoners. And it is the fact uh, that uh, we are by no means the worst regime in these islands in terms of providing safety within the Northern Ireland Prison Service, but it has to be ongoing, serious work, engagement by prison staff at the highest level to ensure that that is maintained, and that is their task day and daily. Call Mr Raymond McCartney. I'm going to pre Colour. In the Minister's response to Carlo Boylan, he talked about uh, the approach of dissidents inside. Uh, given what the Director General said on Friday about the ineffectual relationship, which he accepted that there was a, a resistance to change from within prison staff within McGabry, does dissonance take on a whole new meaning in that context? Well, I'm not sure I've ever used the term dissident to refer to any member of prison staff, but I did say earlier that there are clearly those members of prison staff who find change to the new arrangements more difficult than others. Some who had served in uh, long periods in difficult times took the advantage of the early retirement scheme. Others remain, many of whom are playing very positive roles in the current operation of the prison service, but some are having difficulty adjusting to that. Call Mr. Roy Banks. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister has referred to his action plan and the need to improve the lot of prisoners. Would he accept that it's also vital? that we improve the condition of prison officers and to improve their morale, and whether or not he actually has approached the Secretary of State to see whether or not the previous uh, impositions need to be changed in order to manage that prison in an effective manner. 
Well, I certainly agree with Mr Beggs that the issue of staff morale is an important and a significant one. Um, I have not specifically discussed with the Secretary of State any change to the separated regime. That is her responsibility. Uh, she has not made any proposals to me uh, that she was proposing to change that either. The reality is we are in a situation where separation was granted by a previous Secretary of State, and that is the situation we have to work with. Call Mr Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Minister, it has to be acknowledged that you've been here on a number of occasions uh, robustly uh, dealing with these matters, and you're to be congratulated for that. Yeah, yeah. Minister, can I ask you um, that if one were to compare the date of the report with today, that if you were to visit the prison today, that you would find a transformed regime, that you would find people working together, you would find uh, reduced um, absenteeism, and that you would find more prisoners engaged in meaningful work? Well, I did point out last week, I can't remember if it was in response to Mr Dixon's question on the statement or not, um, that I hoped that more members of the Justice Committee would be able to get the opportunity to visit, because I do believe from my most recent visit, which was now three weeks ago, uh, that there were very significant changes, much uh, reduced sickness rate, uh, therefore uh, better numbers of staff on the landings, positive work being done. Um, I saw, for example, on that occasion, those were engaged um, in some work which was effectively on public service in doing uh, braille uh, booklets, uh, who were actually working through their lunch break with a prison officer who was working through his lunch break because they wanted to get a job done for the benefit of somebody outside. That seems to me symptomatic of the spirit of many of the people in there, just the same as going to visit the new cafe. We've heard a lot about the success of the cabin in Hyde Bank Wood, but there's now a very similar arrangement for the Riverbank Cafe uh, in Magabry, and I think all of that is symptomatic of the Governor and his management team working with staff to ensure better conditions for staff and for prisoners. Before I move to the next question, I must inform the House that question number 10 has been withdrawn. Call Mr Gordon Lyons. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Question 2. The average time to process an enhanced access NI check in 2013-14 was 19 days. In 2014-15 was 16 days, and for the first half of 2015-16 was eight days. With the introduction in April of online applications, there have been significant improvements in the Access NI turnaround times. In addition, the PSNI has recently reviewed and improved the processes for dealing with those enhanced checks which are referred to them. This has resulted in a 70% reduction in the backlog of Access NI checks with the police over the past three months. Mr Lyons for a supplement. Thank you uh, very much. Can I thank the Minister for uh, his answer, and not only for giving the answer, but for the very good news that is contained uh, within it. He will be aware that an awful lot of community and voluntary organisations, a lot of faith-based groups, um, depend on access NI checks. In the past, far too many of them have had to wait far too long uh, for those to come through. So it is very welcome that this online system seems to have helped and that the reduction uh, that, that has come through is obviously uh, very welcome. Can the Minister um, uh, assure the House that he will uh, keep an eye on this situation to ensure um, that the reduction um, continues uh, and that waiting times stay low? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, it's a, a pleasure to welcome Mr Lyons to Justice Question Time, especially when his predecessor, Mr Wilson, tended to be fairly critical of Access NI, so I've logged the praise for Access NI, which has come today. Um, I mean, just to, to give him one specific further statistic, the cases which have been over 60 days with the police for check were 789 in June and were 128 last week. Now, clearly, there will always be cases which do need to be checked in some detail by the police, but that does show a very significant turnaround by the police in terms of their role, as well as by Access NI staff in terms of their role and the enhanced IT system, and I will certainly be keeping an eye on it, as he has asked me. Call Ms. Claire Hanna. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Speaker. I, I, for, I'm sure many members like me won't recognise those uh, waiting times and, and may have been contacted by uh, constituents who are waiting considerably longer. And I know, uh, having come from the voluntary sector, that that's, that's not the story that I've heard uh, from people. But can the minister uh, give assurance that any further um, steps to take up processing will be taken, and particularly in the case where there's an urgent job application, as I'm aware? Uh, people who have waited weeks and even months and have been unable to take up employment during that time? Well, Ms Hannah raises a very reasonable question, which is, of course, quite simple. People who get good service from Access NI don't contact their MLA to complain about it. 
The tens of thousands which go through reasonably speedily go through and people are happy. Some of them say thank you to Access and I, but most people just accept that that's what they should expect from a public service. But I mean, for example, in September, 95% of enhanced certificates within 14 days of receipt of the application, over 98% within 28 days. So we are talking about the small minority, overwhelmingly those which require further check by the police, either the PSNI or another police service. And they are the ones which have been taking, in some cases, very considerable time, but we have now seen significant improvement in the last few months there as well. Call Mr. Kiernan McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if he could advise the House as to when the portable checks will be available? Um, this is an, you know, an ongoing challenge which Mr. M uh, McCarthy highlights. There certainly uh, has been a lot of work done, and I hope that we will be looking at some point in, during the next calendar year to have the full portability of checks. It is certainly something very disappointing because it was something that was actually underway when I became Minister just over five years ago. Changes were then made by the Home Office for, for England and Wales, uh, which had further knock-on effects for us, but we are looking to see that is introduced as fast as possible. And clearly the idea of a portable check, which can be checked online any number of times that people need, uh, will be significantly better than the current system, which is effectively still a paper-based system, even though it's carried out online. I think that will show the significant improvement, particularly for those who are engaged in different areas of voluntary work or a number of short-term periods of employment who need to see that opportunity coming through. Uh, frankly, it can't happen too soon in terms of the complaints that people still have. Call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker, question number three, please. Following the initial pilot across three police districts in Belfast, youth engagement clinics were rolled out across all districts in Northern Ireland over the course of 2014-15, becoming fully operational in April of this year. I took this decision following a positive evaluation of the pilot, which demonstrated a number of benefits for children and young people. It's clear that youth cases which are dealt with at clinics are resolved far more quickly than those which progress to court, meaning that the negative consequences of delay in our system for both victims and offenders can be reduced. Youth engagement clinics can help young people make better informed decisions about their options at an early stage by providing advice and support in both a language and a setting which is appropriate to their age and level of understanding. This includes explaining the consequences of accepting a diversionary or court-ordered disposal and how that might affect them in the future. Participation in the, in the clinics has allowed young people to take responsibility for and understand the consequences of their actions and to get appropriate support to address the underlying causes of their offending behaviour. This approach of supporting children at the earliest stage to address problems which could lead to further offending or risk-taking behaviour is a key element of the scoping study which I commissioned to improve outcomes for children in or on the fringes of the youth justice system. There is clear evidence that the more we can do to prevent young people entering the system in the first place or to divert them from more formal disposals, the better their long-term outcomes. Paul Ms. Lowe for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I want to thank the Minister for a very comprehensive uh, answer. Um, I'm very pleased to hear the clinics are having uh, such very positive uh, impact on the outcomes for our young people. Can I ask the Minister then, in view of the evaluation, uh, has he had other initiatives in mind to build on the success? Well, I thank Ms. Lowe for her question. I think the key issue is the scoping study, which is now looking into the whole operation of youth justice. Uh, we need to ensure that we build on the successes of the youth engagement model and that we continue to see how we can do it to streamline and simplify the system. That's what youth engagement clinics are about. That's what we uh, expect to see uh, followed up in the final report, which is being prepared on that work by criminal justice inspection. And I do think as we look into the scoping study as to how we make further improvements in the future, there will be continued improvement in terms of the speed with which cases are disposed of, the appropriate measures being adopted for individual offenders, and we will certainly hope to see significant improvements for society on the back of that. Call Ms. Rosie McCorley. And I also um, commend the Minister on a very in-depth 
and comprehensive answer. So, just in view of that, could, could the Minister elaborate any further on what lessons have been learned from these clinics that could make access to justice more efficient and more effective? Well, I thank Ms McCauley for her support on that. I think, in a sense, it's slightly early, given that we've only had the pilot scheme running in part of Belfast uh, for any length of time and the wider rollout from April of this year. But I, you know, so we need to be slightly careful. We don't have full statistical basis. But there does seem evidence from practitioners, indeed from some of the young people who are participants themselves, that the arrangements help create a joined up response, which help them see their way to a better future, to managing their behavior so it didn't lead to future offending. And that's clearly something which is to be welcomed in terms of the benefits that provides for the young people themselves and the benefits for those who might have become victims otherwise. There's no doubt as we look generally at the way the clinics have operated, that they've built on past successes of the Youth Justice Agency. And I think we are seeing the improvements, but I, I think what we will see is the, the proper evaluation when we get the Sajinia report in the near, near future. And I will be looking to that for full evidence. Call Mr. Cathal Oshin. Can call Kesht ever a car? The whole question for. Principal Deputy Speaker, again with permission, I will answer questions 4, 5 and 14 together. I announced to the House last week that I welcomed the Access to Justice Review Part 2 report and that the publication of the report would begin a consultation period closing on the 9th of February next year. The report has some 150 wide-ranging recommendations and I hope that those with an interest in improving the justice system and the experience of those who come into contact with the system will take the opportunity to comment on the report. I hope to return to the Assembly before the end of the current mandate to outline my proposed response to the report by setting out thematically the priorities that will drive the future reform agenda. As I've highlighted previously, significant progress has already been made in delivering reforms to many aspects of the justice system, and this reform program will continue. Where there are issues of commonality between current reforms and recommendations in the report, I will reflect on the analysis in the report as I take forward the reforms. In terms of alternative funding arrangements for money damages cases, the report recommends a new approach which will enable the majority of cases currently supported by legal aid to proceed without that support. It's based on a conditional fee agreement with appropriate safeguards to prevent increased costs. This appears to provide a realistic alternative to the existing approach, and in order to ensure that we draw out any concern that might exist, I plan to consult specifically on this issue at the same time as consulting more generally on the report. This will ensure we have a firm basis to proceed with a reform that will save money and improve access to justice. The report makes a number of recommendations in relation to improving the efficiency of criminal proceedings. I plan to take the views of the Lord Chief Justice on these matters. I meet regularly with him, and I expect the report will be a regular focus for future meetings. Mr. O'Shane, for a supplementary. Would the Minister agree with me that without a properly funded legal aid system, then effective access to justice for all will be undermined? Well, I'm quite happy to agree with Mr. Oshin on that one. It was a point which was made in the report. It was a report, uh, point which I made in accepting the report, that we are not looking to reduce legal aid to the bare minimum. We're looking to provide legal aid in a measure which is affordable, but which meets the needs of this society. That's why, for example, the point I highlighted about money damages was about finding alternative ways of funding issues. It's why looking also at matters like mediation as opposed to an adversarial court hearing are being looked at as ways of ensuring that justice is provided, but that is not the same thing as continuing to, in all cases, maintain the current legal aid arrangements. Well, Mr. John Dalla. Uh, Mr. Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker, I've listened very carefully uh, to the Minister. And on this day of glad tidings and great joy in relation to the future of this Assembly, would the Minister consider now looking seriously at legal aid in relation to family law and, and those matters where people have been profoundly affected by the recent uh, scarcity of resources? Well, I will hold my counsel until I've attended an executive meeting shortly, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, as to whether or not I will agree with Mr. Dallet on a day of, you know, of glad tidings or whatever. Indeed, some of his party colleagues may have a different view from the way he's just expressed it. Um, in terms of the specific issue of family cases, I mean, one of the 
major challenges which has confronted uh, the system for some time and which I get frequent correspondence about is the issue of the availability of legal aid for one partner in a family dispute but not to the other and the allegation that frequently comes indeed there are several members in this house at the moment who've made the allegation that that frequently uh, is used as if legal aid is a weapon for the legally aided ex-partner against the partner who is on a modest income which disbars them from legal aid. So those are the kind of issues which do need to be looked to, not cutting out legal aid from the basic key hearings which may deal with a divorce or separation or issues like the custody of children, but stopping the idea that people who would not take a case to court if they were funding it themselves having immediate resource to legal aid to mount a continuing series of challenges. And I believe that that is an entirely appropriate way to change, but we will see what the responses to the consultation document are, and no doubt the joyful Mr. Dallet and his colleagues will be amongst those who will respond. Call Mrs. Karen McEvan. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, could I ask the uh, Minister, would he have a preferred uh, alternative to legal aid? Well, I think it's not so much a preferred alternative to legal aid as a way in which we find that access to justice is provided by a variety of different methods. Um, existing arrangements for legal aid will have to continue in some areas, but mediation, various forms of alternative dispute resolution, um, finding different ways in which, frankly, those who are fighting over money or property of some kind fund it themselves out of the proceeds of that, those are all issues which are entirely relevant to look that we concentrate the payment of traditional legal aid where it is most needed, where it has most effect. And certainly, as I said in response to Mr. Dalip, but to spell out specifically what I said on my previous comment on the report, there is no question of removing those private family law cases entirely from scope, as has been done in England and Wales, and we will ensure that we maintain the basic level of legal aid for a decent civilised society. Well, Ms. Brandon McGoggin. Um, does the Minister agree that one of the main cornerstones of access to justice is legal aid and, and any curtailment in access to legal aid is also a blockage to access to justice? Well, no, Principal Deputy Speaker, I can't agree with Ms McGahan when she puts it as boldly as that. I've made it clear that there are some areas on which traditional legal aid will continue to be provided, but I do believe that there are many areas where at a time of decreasing budgets, of very significant financial pressure on the Justice Department, as indeed the executive as a whole, it is simply not possible to maintain traditional legal aid for all those areas which have had it. And I've just highlighted some of the issues around money damages, around um, ongoing family disputes, and I think we've seen examples from the legal profession where there's been good work done by various forms of alternative dispute resolution, which have shown that it is possible to manage things in a way which is actually more constructive for those who are involved than an adversarial system where two lawyers fight it out and the participants see themselves more as spectators than as participants. If they're participants, they're much more likely to feel that they had a real part to play and they're much more likely to accept the decision of a mediator than is sometimes the case when there's a decision handed down by a judge which they have not really felt they contributed to. Call Mrs. Sandra over Yes, well, Deputy Speaker, uh, the Minister intends to uh, speed up access to justice. How does he see this working uh, with uh, the closure of so many local courts, including the one in Macrofelt in my own constituency? Well, the answer, Principal Deputy Speaker, though I will be making a statement uh, after the Justice Committee has had the opportunity to consider the proposal for court closure, so I'm not discussing Macrofelt or any other court at this stage, but the issue is that access to justice is not access to an inadequate building in every district town. Amongst other parts of access to justice, it is access to a proper, decent, modern courtroom, a place where there is, for example, the ability for segregation for vulnerable uh, witnesses and victims where arrangements are such that there's proper IT, that there's decent disability access, a whole range of matters which, frankly, some of our older courthouses do not currently meet. That concludes the time for listed questions. We now move to topical questions. I call Ms Maeve McLaughlin. Um, and given the protector focus over the last number of weeks on McGabry, would, would the minister agree with me that there are serious flaws uh, in relation to health provision in McGabry that were very clearly highlighted in the CGA report? 
Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I did wonder how many questions we were going to have at McGabry as topical, given that I made a statement on it last week and I've just answered three questions on the main list. But uh, I mean, Ms McLaughlin highlights quite adequately the references which are made to health care uh, in the report uh, of the inspection of McGabry, and that is an issue which is being addressed by the South Eastern Trust, uh, and therefore I should leave that to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety to discuss in detail, other to say that the prison service is certainly seeking to work in partnership with the Trust and the prison oversight group which I chair gets regular reports as we look at the recommendations of the prison review team and uh, those reports include uh, where there's engagement around the health matters which are uh, adjudicated on by RQIA just the same as Sajini deals with the matters which are purely that for the justice system. I thank the Minister for that, but I do feel that in relation to the, the flaws in terms of health that they haven't at this point been adequately highlighted even. But would ask the Minister specifically, given the fact that he has a duty of care uh, in, in terms of the people within McGabry, um, does he feel that now there needs to be a review of the existing relationship between the prison service and the South Eastern Trust? It's certainly a, you know, a significant point which Ms McLaughlin has highlighted, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I don't agree that we need a review of the arrangements. What I do agree is that we need to see that those recommendations which were made by Dame Anne Ors and her team, which are currently being worked through by the South Eastern Trust, uh, checked over by RQIA, need to be carried through in full, and that the partnership working which is ongoing needs to be uh, reinforced to ensure that the, you know, the lines of communication between the prison staff side and the healthcare staff side are fully dealt with. Those are the kind of points which come back. But frankly, I don't think it's a matter of another review. I think it's a matter of ensuring the recommendations we've already got are put into place. Call Mr. Raymond McCartney. Uh, I've got a previous last comment, Cooler. I, I suppose in relation to, uh, in terms of uh, McGabry being topical, I think it's topical in the fact that we have an opportunity and perhaps an opportunity if, if, if taken then it won't feature in topical questions perhaps every time there is topical questions. So with that in mind, uh, the, the Minister has mentioned the fact that there's been a new appointment of, of the senior governor in McGabry. Uh, can the Minister give a categoric assurance that he, he will be allowed to, to run the prison, that he will receive the closest cooperation between himself and the Director General to do that? Looks like I've lost the topicality argument, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, but I, I take the, you know, the significant and serious substantive point that Mr McCartney raises, and it's an issue which he has raised previously. Uh, it is an ongoing challenge to ensure that the prison is run by the governor and his senior team, but that involves cooperation with other staff. It involves cooperation uh, with the staff associations who represent the staff. It involves you know, staff, not just disciplined staff, but those who are involved as instructors, you know, the ancillary staff, the education staff, the healthcare staff. You know, there is a huge mix of responsibilities there. Um, I'm always slightly reticent when I'm asked to give guarantees in this chamber for matters which are not my direct day-to-day -day responsibility, but I have certainly seen since the arrival of Phil Ragg, the current governor, extremely good work being done, close cooperation with prison service headquarters and with the department, an understanding of the challenges which uh, McGabry faces. And remember, Phil Ragg's previous experience was as governing Belmarsh, which may not be as complex as McGabry, but does deal with some of the most difficult prisoners who are in custody in England and Wales. So he clearly has a range of experience there, as well as his experience in other mainstream, if you want to put it that way, prisons, which is being put to good use. And I have no doubt that the very positive relationship between him and the Director General, the other members of the senior team, and his senior team in McGabry, and even, dare I say it, the minister and senior team in the department, is having good effects already in McGabry, and I have no doubt that that will continue. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and indeed, can I thank the minister for his answer in relation to that question and, and, and his approach to it, because I, I think in, at the committee meeting last week, and in, even in the minister's earlier questions, uh, and Oars in 2011 mentioned that one of the ways around the complexity of McGabry was the theme many prisons. I would just have a concern that that, that has been postponed until a new capital vote. 
And that's why I've made the point, if the, the, if the number one governor in McGabry can find the means uh, to bring about three million prisons, it shouldn't be contingent on a capital bill. And I just want if the minister would agree with that approach. Well, I think the, the reality is we cannot do all that we would wish to do around the concept of three mini prisons without a fairly significant capital investment. So, for example, we, we look at different arrangements for visitors. You know, that's at a point which cannot be accommodated in the concept of three mini prisons within the current <coughs> capital configuration. Uh, I think, however, Mr. McCartney does highlight a reasonable point as to how we actually manage the arrangements for prisoners both for those who are within the two separated houses and the other category prisoners and the great run of the prison population, the 90 plus percent who are not in those circumstances. And that is a matter of seeking to manage staffing as best can be to ensure that the staffing pressures which exist in Roe and Bush don't impact on staffing elsewhere. That's why, for example, the reduction in the numbers on sick leave on a daily basis has been so important to ensure that we can make those changes and we can disrupt the regime for the 90% as little as possible. But in, you know, in terms of other issues, as I say, I don't think it will be possible to do all we would hope to do without a significant injection of capital funding. And it is one of those points which, if the finance minister were in the House, I'd be reminding him that there is sometimes more capital available than resource funding available, and capital investment in our prisons could significantly save on ongoing resource expenditure. So if there's anybody here who would like to report that to the finance minister, I'd be very grateful. Mr Gordon Lyons. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Principal. Deputy Speaker, could the uh, minister provide the House an update on his depart department's current budgetary position? Um, well, it's certainly not as easy as the access, and I question Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, the, re the reality, Principal Deputy Speaker, is just before I came into the chamber, I saw a paper which is due to go to the executive uh, later this afternoon to deal with an exceptional November monitoring round. On the basis that it is executive in confidence, I cannot uh, give the members as full an update as I would wish. But I can say that it is clear there are very significant ongoing pressures within the Department of Justice. There has been some slight benefit this year because police overtime has been slightly less than might have been the case in other circumstances, a further benefit of a relatively peaceful summer, which we should all be grateful for, for more than just financial grounds. But there are still, as members will be aware, very significant ongoing pressures around legal aid. And we will see exactly how that resolves, particularly in the context of um, the current withdrawal from work by some solicitors and some barristers, and the potential that if following the judicial review they're back to work, there may be further pressures there. So um, if that has given a flavour without giving away executive secrets, I hope it's been helpful. Mr. Lyons for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for certainly adding uh, some or giving me some flavour uh, of the current budgetary uh, position. Uh, however, there was an awful lot of concern expressed uh, last year in relation to a four. Uh, £14 million uh, underspend uh, by the PSNI. Can uh, the Minister provide the House with any assurances uh, that such money will not be returned uh, again this year? Well, I could certainly give the House the assurance that I would do my best to see that any money which is not required by any part of the justice system is recycled to other parts of the justice system under pressure, whether it be legal aid or prisons or courts, all of which have pressures at the present time. The reality is, um, in many cases, uh, when uh, funding is allocated mid-year, it is very difficult for spending areas to make full use of that if they're expecting a cut in the following year. And that is the unfortunate reality of what happened to the funding that was allocated in-year to the police last year. If the police had certainty of funding for a four- or five-year period, then they would be recruiting more officers than they are currently able to recruit and police numbers currently stand below the recommendation of the review which was carried out two years ago. So there are clearly areas where the police, if they had certainty of funding, would be in a better position to spend their funding for a period of years than they are when they are given small sums in year. And that is the challenge which faces the executive as a whole to get a coherent budgeting pattern through the next CSR period 
so that agencies know where they are. And I suspect that the police service is not the only service which is in a very similar position. They don't have the capacity to suddenly squirrel away money you know, into one or two short-term things at the end of the financial year because so much of their budget is tied up with staffing matters. That's a challenge that we now face to try to get matters resolved, which I trust we'll be in a position to do after the Chancellor's autumn statement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm sure the Minister will join with me in condemning the racist attack on members of the Muslim uh, community in Ballymena. Um, and I wonder would he like to update us uh, in relation to what measures are in place to support our Muslim uh, community? Well, certainly I would like, I suspect, all members of this House immediately join Ms. Rowan in condemnation of that particular attack in um, Ballykeel last night and indeed a number of other attacks which have happened in recent weeks, uh, mostly in Belfast. Um, whatever the crude motivation may be, there can be no excuse for what went on last night. So uh, we need to look to be, uh, not intrude on operational issues for the Chief Constable or indeed for the Director of Public Prosecutions. We do have the ability for enhanced sentences relating to, to hate crime. There's a lot of work being done around the, the role of hate crime advocates. Uh, the Hate Incident Practical Action Scheme deals with providing uh, protective benefits. Uh, the Community Safety Strategy has elements about reducing the harm from uh, hate crime, whether it be racial or religious or whatever. So there are, you know, there's a number of uh, streams of work carrying through here. But it is clearly an issue where, most of all, we need a united community response against such crimes. I'd like to thank the Minister uh, for that answer, and I absolutely agree with him on the operational independence, and it is something we will be raising at the Policing Board. Just in, in the question is in relation to the last comment you made about United Front. Um, I, I think it is very important that all departments work together and I wonder would the Minister confirm that he's willing to work with all the departments to make sure people from uh, different countries who have travelled here and, and live here and families who have lived here for 20 years and still have a petrol bomb come through their house don't feel afraid. That's one of those occasions when you just like to say yes, Principal Deputy Speaker, but I should go a little bit further. Certainly, I think we have both the issue, as is highlighted, of those who've been here for a number of years but who are still subjected to a variety of hate crimes, and the issue of the Syrian refugees who we expect to be in Northern Ireland before Christmas. And I have no doubt that um, there is a relatively limited role for my department, but where there is a role for the justice agencies, they will play their part. Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Speaker. Uh, can I, in addition to the last question, also ask the, the Minister if he will uh, join in the House in condemning uh, not only the petrol bomb attack on the Ibrahim family home in Balamina, but also uh, concerning uh, social media posts today that are allegedly from uh, the UPRG threatening uh, the housing executive uh, with regard to allocation of housing to refugees uh, and indeed a number of assaults that have taken place in my own constituency of East Belfast and will he send a clear message uh, that Northern Irish citizens of uh, black and minority ethnic background and indeed refugees coming to these shores will be warmly welcomed and receive the statutory support to which they are entitled. Well, certainly anything the DOJ can do, as I've just said to Ms. Ran, the DOJ will do to play its part in dealing with hate crime, in ensuring that we provide support services for those who will be coming shortly as refugees, and ensuring that we play our part in helping create the mood within the public, which recognizes the position of those who have been citizens here for many years, whatever their skin color or their religious belief may be. A little first supplementary. I thank the minister for his response, and would he agree that anyone threatening people from uh, a black and minority ethnic background is merely playing into the hands of the terrorists who seek to divide our community and threaten our freedoms? And would he agree that there is now a long overdue need for the OFM DFM to bring forward the racial equality strategy and the refugee integration strategy? And will he work at the executive table to ensure they are delivered? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, just as I had to be slightly cautious talking about health care and prisons, speaking for the Minister of Health, um, I'm not sure that the First Minister or Deputy First Minister would appreciate me speaking for them, but certainly uh, the DOJ will play its part in the development of any of those strategies, 
which are the responsibility across the executive, even if they're led by another department. It's absolutely vital that we show a united voice. It's absolutely vital that we stand up against those thugs and terrorists, whatever their claimed motivation, who would threaten people in this society, wherever they come from, for whatever their background is. And I think only a united view from this chamber, backed up by a united view of the executive, and strategies in place which ensure all the relevant agencies work together will actually succeed in dealing with those problems. That concludes the period of time for listed questions to the Minister of Justice.